Hello everyone and welcome to this, the final episode of The Bub Report for the year ending 2023. Now 2023 was a year when the news and events animating life in the national community came at you fast. It is really impossible to look back at this year and not compare how we started the year to where we are now. Here on The Bub Report, we dispassionately examined the ups, downs, trials and triumphs affecting Grenada, the Caribbean, and the Caribbean diaspora. In the next 60 minutes, we will revisit some of the stories we covered through the lens of our more than 150 guests who graced our platform. In 2023, I also embarked on a homecoming journey to the land of my African ancestors to reconnect and reckon with the darkest part of our history as people of African descent in the diaspora. But first, we pay tribute to some of the Grenadian citizens we lost in 2023. We began the year by remembering the late Beverly Steele, former resident tutor of the University of the West Indies and historian who died two months shy of her own husband's death in February of 2023. Mr. William Steele, like his wife, dedicated his life to education at the Presentation Brothers College in Grenada, where he served as a physics and chemistry teacher for many years and as vice principal for a time. In, in, in Beverly's passing, I think we, we have an opportunity to revisit her work and to make that work available. I think lots of our um, history and stuff is not in the school system, is not taught in schools. And I think we, we really need to take a look at how we teach our heritage, how we teach our history, and make sure that, that this material remains in the school system or gets into the school system so that people learn about the works that we've done, that people have done over the years, and that any way moving forward, we have to have access to the materials that were produced about our history and culture. And Beverly has produced a number of things that, that are essential to, the, to moving forward. She laid the foundation in looking at Grenada's history and culture. Uh, from the, the 1970s on. And I think that in itself sp speaks for itself in, in the contribution she has made. And in the first quarter of 2023, labor issues took center stage as labor unions in Grenada sounded the alarm concerning the dismissal of contract employees on the sister isle of Kariaku, who they claim were not granted due process privileges by the Ministry of Labor and who were not given the option of being regularized as promised by the new incoming administration in St. George's. Because what we are seeing is a victimization of workers. We are seeing actions by this administration that cannot point to or lead to any kind of transformation. Where you have workers that are being uh, summarily dismissed, you have a worker who is 55 years old, who has been working with the government for the last, um, 17 years um, and more persons who are well qualified. When we went to the when we when the union went to the sister isle of Carrick and Pity Martinic last year, one in sep end of September, one of the things that we found is that, and I would want to use the word per capita, we walked into an office and every single person that you are speaking to there 
has an associate's degree, a first degree, is working towards a master's degree, and even have a master's degree. So it's not that persons are not qualified. It's not that they are not doing their, their jobs. There has been no complaints about how they have been administering their jobs and what they've been giving to government. But we are seeing so many firings and unfair dismissals um, that the Employment Code 1999, Grenada Employment Code, speaks out against. How does a worker report to work today and you give that person a termination letter? There's no notice, there's no warning, and you treat that person almost as if they were a criminal because you hand them that letter summarily, their colleagues are there, they feel ashamed, they feel embarrassed. Grenada is signed on to conventions with the UN, with the United Nations, and so that prohibit that kind of a shotgun firing where an employee has not committed a criminal act that compromises the workplace or compromises the security of other workers. Why does that person have to get fired so summarily? Why do you want to embarrass them? And so what we're seeing is actions by this administration and by senior public offici officials that is seeking to embarrass workers, that is seeking to hurt workers, and that, that is not something that the union can sit quiet about. It is not something I can sit quiet about. And it's not certainly what, not what we are expecting of this new administration. One has to understand, Dr. Bob, that the workers, we didn't seek out this fight or this battle. The workers reach out to us. They are union due pay members. They are um, in the low income bracket. They are all women, vulnerable women. They are not even uh, necessarily public service commission workers, so they don't have the luxury now of pension and so forth. They have a low salary, and they reached out to us. So the legal and the moral thing to do was to have spoken on the issue. So our efforts in terms of speaking on it, um, it did not lead to anywhere that seemed as though we'll come to mutually beneficial grounds. Um, so we had to act. At the end of July, all into August, basically every week, we were hearing of a new termination with some of our members. Um, under my leadership, I could not have allowed that um, to continue. So we brought it to the fore um, for distillation and for ventilation. Um, mind you, the matter is before the Ministry of Labor as we speak. And up to this day, we are in 2023. The players involved on the government and have not come in a meaningful way in a meaningful way to address this matter at the Ministry of Labor at the level of conciliation. And sticking to the theme of firings, the newly appointed Labor Commissioner and the first woman to serve in that role, who was just three and a half months into her two-year stint, was also terminated by the government. Senator Andre Lewis and the Labor community was also caught off, off guard by her firing. In other words, so this year, after three and a half months, after three and a half months, you are in a position where you are saying she has not fitted in well with the, the, the program of the general outlook to enhance labor climate. And therefore, one is forced to give considerations to what are the issues that the labor commissioner had before her during that period of time. And certainly, the Port Authority matter will stand out. Certainly, I got a call from the leader of one of our trade unions on Friday morning after hearing about this development, who was astounded, right? Who, who basically couldn't understand what was happening. Because for a very long time, after visiting the Ministry of Labor and the very methodical manner in which the Labor Commissioner addressed the issues, right, he, he was taken aback. To, to learn that she's terminated, right? And those reasons um, advance. So it, it raises more questions than answers. And certainly for us in the labor movement and Tao in particular, we have picked up that there may have been concerns, right? Expressed by certain members of the, the corporate world. Yes, at certain businesses, right? And I said, that fits, that appears to fit it. Because in the absence of broadened um, discussions and the fact that we are a discerning population. I want you to pay particular attention to one of the reasons advances. Um, she did not fit in well with a general outlook to enhance the labor climate. 2023 was also the year that witnessed the enactment of a new minimum wage for the Grenadian working class. The new minimum wage capped a series of consultations that the current administration held with the private sector 
and civil society organizations, as well as with the general public. The minimum salary or wage for any working person will be no less than EC $1,200 a month or no less than $60 a day and would apply to industrial and clerical security guards, domestic workers, caregivers of the elderly, workers in the bakeries, agricultural sector workers, construction workers, shop assistants, workers in the hospitality industry, and vehicle drivers. Salary increases for members of parliament also came in for high praise by former Senate president and trade unionist Chester Humphrey. I support, I support uh, the last review done by the government and the award it has made in respect of both the minimum wage, and I have some issues with the minimum wage schedule and how how it was done. Um, there, there are some significant, in my view, um, there are some significant defects in it. Um, but I, I support what has been done, and I believe that the the emoluments given to members of parliament, right, is fair. It is ultra modest, in my view. I don't think that the award um, could be deemed to be um, uh, massive in any way. I think the award has been very conservative and it is fair. And let me go through that for a moment. We deem parliament to be one of the highest, if not the highest institution in the land. Mm -hmm. The work of parliament or the legislature is to pass laws for the good governance, peace, stability, and progress of the community living within the state of Grenada. That, that, that's the role of parliament, to pass laws. And therefore, what is the value we attach to the work that parliament does? Passing laws for the good governance, which covers every aspect of life of members of this community in the state of Grenada. You have a situation in which there are parliamentarians who earn less in remunerations than the basic pay of the regular Imani. That's a fact. And I know it because I have been there. There are parliamentarians, members of the House of Representatives, and members of the Senate who reside in the other branch of government, namely the executive, who are paid not one cent for the work that they do. If you are a member of the branch, of government, government referred to as the cabinet, you get not one cent for your parliamentary duties. And you are elected by the people. So that the basic $800 and $900 paid to an Imani, an Imani makes more money than a member of parliament. The only time you receive a new in remuneration when you're in parliament is if you belong to the opposition bench. And then what is the pay there? The pay there is $1,200 a month. And since 2013 to now, there has been absolutely no adjustment to the renumeration of parliamentarians. None. Also in the first quarter of 2023, the government announced its intention to shut down the loss-making marketing and national importing board. The closure of the loss-making entity resulted in the loss of 70 jobs and livelihoods. A new entity is expected to take the MNIB's place in the new year in the form of a private-public partnership. And, you know, Martin Buddha has so many managers. Why haven't these people been called to account by the management, by the board, and by the line minister or ministry of Martin Board? So I think from the line minister, 
the line ministry, line minister, the board, and the management of marketing board, all of them had to take the, the, the charge for this. And it mm -hmm. must not just be said the manager of marketing board, you know, because the parliament, the line minister, and ministry, they have to ensure that 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 what has to be done within marketing board should have been done over the years. Right? And in so, retrospect, we're talking about the previous line, of course, the, the marketing board, as we know, is uh, was under the Ministry of Finance at the time. The line minister was former Prime Minister, now opposition leader, Dr. Keith Rich. Mitchell. He was yep. the Minister of Finance. Yes. Yes, and I, and I think um, as Prime Minister, I don't think that is the best ministry that Martin Bush should have been. I think he should have been under the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. I don't know that a prime minister, with all of what he has to do, is the fittest person to take care of Martin Bush. But the the administration, that's how that's what they determined should have happened. So yeah, I will go right to the minister responsible for Martin Bull, right to the minister because not I mean ministers and government they know how to function. You don't have to personally and individually um, see after the affairs. You have your designates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So the blame has to go then right up to the prime minister because agriculture is is the most critical sector in in the in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. If we have to look at restructuring marketing board, the first thing we need to do have to resurrect agriculture resurrect agriculture when we when agriculture is in full swing marketing board will have the 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 the, 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 the produce to market over the years marketing board have been losing a lot and lot a lot of money every year marketing board is buying sugar and rice from uh supply overseas they're selling the sugar and the rice to the smaller shops. The smaller shops are making a profit, but mar marketing board is running at a loss. If you go back and you look at the records in the parliament, you'll see that every single year, government have to go to marketing board to, to authorize marketing board to borrow money. To borrow money, And of course, government being the guarantor. When the government can't pay, when the marketing board can't pay, marketing, the government have to step in and pay. Data protection came under the microscope in late March, early April, when the NDC administration piloted the 2023 Data Protection Bill. The bill aims to establish a comprehensive framework for managing the processing of personal data in Grenada. Now, while the bill intended to create a broad-based framework for data protection, many citizens expressed concern about its far-reaching powers in breaching their constitutional protections and rights to privacy. We sat with Senator Claudette Joseph, Grenada's Attorney General, as well as Dr. Francis Alexis and the Bar Association to discuss its impacts and implications. The fact that we ramped it means that these pieces of legislation need to be looked at carefully. We don't know who might be an authorized officer, meaning there are no criteria set out in the act the bill for a person being an authorized officer. That's point one. It's the first point I made. It is too open-ended. We, I also complain about the chief executive officer. I know the bill defines it, but in the context of this bill, the definition in the bill is universal. It's not confined to this bill. And at the very least, this bill should identify who would be the chief executive officer of the commission in any event. The idea that not only the commission itself, but the chief executive officer may delegate any power or function under this act to an authorized officer it must be an abuse of power eh? mm -hmm. by parliament. That clause needs surgery, if not elimination. Suggestions for amendments to the bill from the bar. But um, Minister, I, wouldn't you wouldn't you concede wouldn't you concede that this is putting the cart before the horse? In other words, you brought the legislation to Parliament and it was only after uh, some citizens raise concerns that we now have in consultations on the legislation, although notwithstanding you said legislation was held in the past, although the Bar Association said 
that they can't remember having any consultations on this. And my brother, in the past. my brother, yes. government is a continuum. Uh huh. Government is a continuum, meaning that government continues. The persons who administer the government may change from time to time, but government decisions, the decisions of the past government, bind this current government because government continues. It's, it is a continuum. So if I inherit a bill, if we inherit a bill that is at the stage where it just has to go to parliament, the only thing that prevented it from parliament is an intervening election. And the supporting information suggests that consultations took place. We are to take that in good faith and move forward if it is in the interest of the, of the people and if it supports government policy to move forward, which is what yeah, we did. I, I, so I don't think that is a dispute. I don't I'm think sorry. that is a dispute. Yeah, I'm sorry. So let me finish. So having done that and moving forward, and some of the people who felt they should be consulted, they come forward and they say, hey, we were not consulted, right? We are doing what we should be, what we should have done. We've made some changes since up to the committee stage. The, the bill is scheduled to be in the Senate um, next week, but up to a few days ago, I sat with the president of the bar and we agreed that the bill can be amended as all other bills that pass in parliament, as all other bills. Amendments may occur. So far, I have received no reason from the Bar Association, no dossier as promised, that would cause me to say to my cabinet colleagues, here we have these suggested amendments, let's do them before we go forward. There's so spe specific do. operational um, uh, 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 suggestions did not come forward from the bar. No. You said that they just made no. very open-ended suggestions, very, but not yeah. very uh, clearly operationally definable suggestions that you can work with uh, through the, the piloting process of the legislation. You said it much better than I could have. There's a lot of noise around the data protection bill that, in my respectful view, is not warranted. I, I was one of those making noise. I mean, and it's simply because I was concerned about that specific section 33. And I think some of those noises you say, respect with respect to you, you're saying it's not warranted. But I believe some of those noises were warranted. But, you know, we can agree to disagree on that. We ended the first quarter of 2023 by witnessing a historic apology from the British-based Trevelyan family in Grenada. The aristocratic family publicly apologized for their ownership of more than a thousand enslaved Africans in Grenada and a promise to make good on a hundred thousand pound reparations check for the purposes of education and research into slavery and reparations. Their apology came on the heels of the activist work of the Grenada National Reparations Committee to demand reparations for the historic and a sustained crime of slavery in Grenada and the Caribbean. Their presence in Grenada drew strong reaction from some who felt that their apology was an opportunistic exercise to capitalize on the burgeoning reparations movement. We have noticed over the past year or so, we have made significant strides with regards to mm. reparative justice. Um, we have seen recently the King of Holland apologizing, the Prime Minister of Holland apologizing on December 18th last year. Um, we've seen the Laura Trevelyan Initiative um, in Grenada, which was really and truly a watershed moment for the reparative struggle here in the Anglophone Caribbean, which has then led to the establishment of the Hayes of Enslavers Organization in the UK which Laura and other, other persons who benefited from the slave trade and slavery, they have formed themselves into a committee to, to lobby and to put pressure on the, on the powers that be in the United Kingdom to push reparations. So we have done a lot. A lot has happened with regards to the advancement of the struggle for reparative justice. In with you, Laura and John, um, since your families, you and your family's visit to Grenada, you have submitted a, a early retirement as, as a journalist uh, mm -hmm. with the British Broadcasting Corporation, you said, to 
uh, dedicate your, uh, your your services to the cause of re reparations. Now, what motivated this move? Some might have questioned your intentions in that respect. Laura. Yes, Kellon, what I said was that I was joining the Caribbean's fight for reparatory justice. Uh, because in the wake of our family's apology in Grenada, so there was so much reaction around the world that was flooding in. And so many families that contacted me, so many individuals, just so many people who had questions and felt that what he, we had done was encouraging, that guided really by Sir Hilary Beckles, the chair of CARICOM's Reparations Commission, who encouraged me to think of myself as somebody who could communicate on behalf of the Caribbean and its demand for reparatory justice. Um, I hoped that I could try to make a difference, and that's what I've been trying to do. I mean, I always said to the family while we were putting this um, apology together, which took a long time to negotiate, and we had many Zoom meetings over the year before we um, finally went and made the apology public. Um, I, I talked a lot about the fact that the organising the letter was going to be difficult and, uh, and complex, but actually once it went out into the world, we were very clear that, the, um, that what was going to happen then was unpredictable. And certainly I think that's proved true because I think since that time, um, the response has been very varied. Um, on the whole, I think we've been overwhelmed by the fact that it seems to have been received quite positively. And we've also been very, um, very positive about the fact that it also seems to have made quite a difference. It seems to have engendered a conversation, which I think um, was was certainly there. But we the, le the, the apology seems to have... Um, opened things up a bit. So there's been a lot of uh, press coverage. There's been a lot of uh, action on social media. Um, the family has become very galvanized. I think we've also encouraged other families to start thinking about doing the same. So I would say that although there has been the, um, we knew there was going to be some criticism and there's certainly been some criticism. I think overall we've been encouraged by the positive feedback that we've got and reception that the, the apologies mm -hmm. uh, has received. In the second quarter of the year, the government settled the beleaguered Kimpton Kawana Bay CBI project. And this was also cause for much debate on our program. We are not destructors. We are developers. Well, 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 some may say that developers are destructors. And, 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 and the, the, the counter argument here, Kamal, would be well, uh, you, you're saying that, Science. you know. It, let me let me get a word in here. <laughs> so, you're, yeah. so you're saying that, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. The, 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 the point, the, the, the question is, uh, Kamal, are you, are you convinced that uh, the, what has been built at, at Lassages uh, would be in harmony with, with the environment, that, that, that you think you can just restore uh, an ecosystem in harmony with a hotel project? Is, is that what, what you're trying to do? So you're the savior of last suggestions. So you're I saving am. last suggestions. So how did last suggestions survive for thousands science. of years? Without you? Go to engineering, go to engineering and science, and then you can make joke of me or not. Come on, go come on, come on. You are not exactly an unbiased scientific observer of this, are you? You're not you are unbiased. Not, uh, you, are the, you are repeating what they are you saying. Have long, you, have you, have long are saying. you are not unbiased. You're the promoter of the project. So when you say that, oh, they don't want to listen to science, you mean they don't want to listen to your version of science? They have no. their own science. You have your no, science. Brian. No, Brian. Uh, not Brian. 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 Come on, let him get a word in. Come on. <laughs> we appointed the best engineers. We appointed the best engineers. I think you you know maybe uh, what, what, Reed Smith and uh, we appointed yeah. the best engineers. I cannot tell you that I'm the one who decide to remove this or do that, uh, though I'm an engineer. But you know we, what? Yeah. We and appointed who, the best experts in there. Yeah. And who uh, pays uh, the engineer? Uh, you. So the engineer uh, is working for you, right? If, so if you, you want to go in this formula, you are paying the tax. Come on, come on, come on. Let him get a word in. Let him get a word. Go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. When you say that you nobody wants to listen to science, you mean nobody wants to listen to you? That you cannot say that you are an uh, an unbiased scientific observer of this. You are the, the project promoter, and you yourself, as you said, is is not an environmentalist, nor am I. So 
there are two versions to the, to the reality of what is. And for you to say that you're the savior of La Sagesse, I think is a little bit strong. And if that isn't chutzpah, I don't know what is, right? You're not the savior of La Sagesse. La Sagesse has been there for millions of years. And yes, it, yes, of course, there's issues with pollution and so forth. But the, for you to come and say that you have saved La Sagesse, and saving it for whom? Are you saving it for Grenadians or for your hotel guests? Right? I'm Grenadian, by the way. Huh? Yeah, right. So, yeah, we get that. You've okay. got your passport. If the state is going to acquire the property, then the investors will have a right to seek compensation. We don't know how much that is, right? So we are saying we're moving into a, a situation of acquisition. These are investors. Remember, they invest into the property. They got a Grenada passport. They are looking for a return on the investment. We, the matter could not go further because of a dis dispute, a disagreement with the government and you were sent to arbitration. We felt as the government at the time that we had sufficient evidence to show that what the investor was requesting was not justifiable because you had to put 20% down as part of, you see, I'm saying that because I didn't hear the, what was said before, Yeah. but mm -hmm. you must put 20% down of your own um, as equity. And based on the value of the property, you will calculate how many passports you will need. Um, and the investor came and asked for more passports because he needed to raise Extra, extra amount of money i think it's 99 million i don't remember how much it is now so all these were going back and forth with the investors saying well i need some more and we say well why you need all this additional uh, sum of money when you are required to put 20 percent and so the negotiation broke down and that's where we are so when the government announced that they will acquire it and then the investors can seek compensation we are very concerned you look towards um getting a settlement and that's the whole idea behind you know negotiations there's a give and take you go to court somebody win the other body loses and our experience before exit is clear with respect to grand lake government had a couple opportunities to settle the grand lake dispute so to speak before the matter got to the international court and what we end up settling for international court was way above what was potentially possible in fact the numbers are on the table at the time were lower had we agreed then and settled as a government as parties outside of court um so that was a lesson for us um even though some people believe that no 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 this is different from grand lake and we will win there's absolutely no guarantee so you go based on the probability of success and you look at the opportunity cost apart from the financial Cost in terms of legal fees and so forth, the opportunity cost. What is happening while this edifice stands? Um, in the sea blast, expose, kids are leaving school, looking for employment opportunities and so on. It's a waste. Um, so I just want to make those couple of points, Kellon. Okay. Uh, did we pay anything to the developers? I'm not too sure if money has yet passed on, but obviously I think the deal is x amount upon um signing and then y at a later stage but i couldn't confirm you know yeah you you, you couldn't confirm okay no, I'm, um, I'm not now in, it's it's, I'm not it's, in, it's... Not in that, let me tell you i'm not in that space right? okay not, understood understood yes yeah, yeah I, I understood now uh, let us now that it's 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 back in government's hands of course you know and and this is where i'm going to bring bran here we, we lost mr joseph for a second um <clears throat> but uh, one of the the issues and concerns that bran has always raised uh is just the nature of the cbi project which tends to be uh, real estate and tourism driven uh bran you you have any reaction to um this out of court settlement on this matter i'm not sure no. if you're following it but... I'm a financial person, and how can I make comments yeah. about anything financial when I have no numbers to go on? Yeah. The, the only number I've heard there is 111 million. I haven't heard what it actually cost us. Mr. Duncan says X up front and Y. Why don't we get the numbers? Now that the deal is done, now that it's all been signed and the dust has settled, we, the people, the, the, to, to form an opinion, we need facts. 
we don't have any numbers. So we don't know how much we're paying. We don't know how much it's going to cost us in terms of finishing the project. How much do we have to pay to the developer? How many, how are we going to fund this? Well, of course, passports. Well, no, well, I mean, good, good, good point, Brian. I think in preparation for the, um, for the discussion this morning, the information as in the public domain would have been helpful. So obviously the $111 million is in the public domain because that um, document, you know, is on the ICSID website, right? Uh, in terms of the, the claim made by um, Chublu Bay Development and others. In terms of the actual settlement, the parliament sitting that was last held, they spoke to the amongst that have been agreed upon. So that too is in the public domain in the uh, 22 million. And how, and how much was that? That was 22 million, 20, 22 million US dollars. We're right? going to have to pay them 22 million. Yes. Right. And obviously there are additional costs, which would include the compensation for people with the acquisition of the property. Because remember, the way the project is designed, right, you have to go into the, the legal documents. Yeah. So that people actually have um, property rights that mm. need to be respected, right, in our jurisdiction. So compulsory acquisition is something that happens throughout the world. The question is, what is a fair and just compensation for those persons whose properties have been acquired? And that is a where... A question, a question. So these are people who would have bought into the previous project, right? Correct. And, and are now part owners of the previous project and would have, received, and would have received passports. As Definitely. Part. De absolutely. Right. So we're now talking about compulsorily acquiring their shares in the hotel. Their, their 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 ownership rights in the hotel. We're talking about buying that back. What, are, what happens to their passports? Do we get that back too? No, 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 no. That is untouched, not affected in any way, shape, or form. So they would have bought. They would have bought in, gotten passports, and now we're buying them back. But they still have the passports. Do you see something wrong in this? Absolutely nothing wrong in that. Your purchase had different components uh, to it. <laughs> well, I don't see how you can see there is nothing wrong with this because if I buy something. And it comes with certain rights. And I am there selling the, those rights. Therefore, basically, I get a passport for nothing. Because well, they would have bought I, 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 I think, I think not, Brian. That is Let me finish. Let me finish. They would have bought is, into yeah. the scheme. They would have bought into the Kawana Bay scheme. Say they spent 200000 300000 they bought in and they got their passports. The government is now going to buy them back at somewhere about the same price. So well, we, 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 end we, we, the we get a passport for little no, or nothing. No, we, we, we do not know that, Brian. So there's a freehold interest in the real property, right, that the government is going to acquire. And some people have freehold, you know, uh, interest in the property, which has to be... Um, so in, in addition to the 22 million, do we have an estimate as to how much we're going to have to pay these people? for their property interests. No, I do not have that figure. I don't have that figure. But how, yeah. how, how can yeah. that figure not be there? I mean, this is what I'm talking about. No, no, hello, Brian. This is Brian, what I'm Brian, talking Brian, about, Brian, the whole CBI Brian, project. Brian, the whole Brian. CBI project has no transparency. We get no numbers. We don't know how many people are involved. We don't know the numbers. We, we don't know. Should your loved ones pass on, they deserve to be treated with dignity. And at S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, we can provide you with that service. We can take you every step of the way during your sorrowful moments. When that need arises, call S.A. Johnson Funeral Home at 347-777-9797. That's 347-777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home is a Caribbean family-owned funeral home here in Brooklyn, providing funeral services, but in a dignified way. From cremation to burial, to the repatriation of your loved ones, you don't have to go through the hassle as we provide exceptional service that allows you to mourn and heal peacefully. For more information, visit our website, www.sajohnsonfuneral.org. Send us an email at sajfuneral at aol.com or call 347 777-9797. S.A. Johnson Funeral Home, because you deserve to be treated with dignity. In 2023, several murders rocked the national community, and Grenada also witnessed a significant upsurge in crime. John T. Robinson's murder 
in the environs of the BBC beach defined a national discourse in the second quarter of the year with his sexuality as a subtext to some of the conversations. I mean, one of the things we have to look at is first, you know, just the individual, bold, genuine, themselves. I think that when you look at someone who was just 24 years or just 24 years of age and found themselves with a voice that many persons did not know how to how to deal with. He was bold. He was out there. He did not hide who he was. Um, who in his, you know, I think it's a different flavor when you find someone who can just speak their mind around the issues that are happening. And that did not stop different levels of stigma, discrimination, and to the point violence, um, which he faced. Mm -hmm. And so what we look at is when this news came to me, to be quite honest, it knotted my stomach. Where I was felt like it faded to the back. This was a young man for the last three, three into four years, we engaged on different issues. Um, and I think that, you know, his untimely demise, regardless of who or what the situation may be, was certainly, you know, not good at all. What is a year without politics? We now chronicle some of the big interviews we had with some of Grenada's most newsworthy politicians for 2023. We began with Peter David, who signaled his intention to offer himself up for political leadership of his party. His appearance on the Bub Report drew sharp reaction from NNP's leader, Dr. Keith Mitchell, who is still yet to appear on this platform. This is what he said, but it's mandated that there should be a convention every year in the new national party. Okay. Uh, well, let us talk about the, the future of the leadership of the party. What, what, what is Dr. Mitchell saying about his role as future leader of the party? Are you going to be uh, offering yourself up as political leader of the party Dr. when Dr. the convention Mitchell, Dr. comes around? As the lawyer said, Dr. Mitchell was elusively clear both in the campaign and after the election that he is, it's his last election run. In fact, that was his, his mantra in the last election. That was his last run, I think, at the swearing ceremony for the leader of the opposition. He did say that he's not going to be participating uh, or putting himself up for leadership in the con next convention, which is, he, he said that uh, uh, earlier this year. So, we anticipate taking him at his word that he's not going to be putting himself up for leadership and there would be other persons putting themselves up for leadership and the party constitution allows a member of the party in good standing to put themselves up for leadership. Would that other person include yourself, Mr. David? Well, I am, I am, <laughs> you, 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 I am giving active consideration to it. Of course, I have paid my dues. I, I go back a long way. My, 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 my good friend Jomo knows most of my history there. I go back 50 years in politics. So I'm giving active consideration to it. Like I told Dr. Mitchell uh, some time ago, uh, once he, 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 it is confirmed, once the party confirms the convention, once the party determines when the convention is going to be, then I'm going to make a public statement on it. But, but to be fair, I can't be, I can't be, other, I can't say other than I'm given very much active consideration to to the issue of leadership of the party, but that depends on a whole heap of of of, of variables, and you know how politics can be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. Mitchell said he's leaving, and certainly I am I am I'm considering it. Okay, uh, the sisterhood between Delma Thomas and Gloria Thomas uh, is is that sisterhood uh, the result of some issues that. Uh, uh, the MP for St. Andrew Northwest is having with a party. That's Delma Thomas. Are, are there any uh, fissures? Are there any uh, uh, divisions there? Uh, uh, bad blood between uh, Sister Thomas and the party, Mr. David? I see you've called me have much more than diplomatic passports. I don't mind. <laughs> 2023 also saw the resignation and subsequent crossing of the floor of MP for St. Andrew Northwest, Delma Thomas. Not since Peter David's expulsion from the NDC and Grace Duncan's resignation from the New National Party in the late 1990s had a political switch create such a buzz on the island. We sat with Delma Thomas 
months before her official resignation from the party. What is the relationship like between you and your leader? Dr. Mitchell, your boss, Dr. Mitchell. Well, I, I would say, we, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how to explain, how, to, how to, to answer this question at this time. I prefer not to answer. You prefer not to answer. I mean, you, you are part of the new national party. I, I, that is, I mean, certainly that he is the, the, the chief whip in the parliament. I'm sure that you ought to be communicating with your leader with respect to your approaches when you go to parliament. Yes, so when, when we have sessions as it relates to approaches to parliament, I do attend those sessions. But to say, well, we have a, a regular communication calling, you know, because even with all that we're saying there and all that you, you, you're dis discussing as it relates to me not saying to them or there's a concern, I've never heard him, how you'd call me on particular issue. He never called me on those particular issues. So I, I, that's the reason why I decided not to answer that particular question because I never... Also so you, you never had a conversation question. you never had a conversation with him but you did have conversations with members of the party other members of the party you did indicate you had conversations yes, with I other did, members yes, of the I party did have, yes but not him because well you see other members would have called me been calling so there are some people members of the party who you have regular communication they would call you see how you're doing you, you, you must appreciate that i mean from government being in opposition it it'd be difficult and therefore, um, there are members who will reach out to you. How are you doing? How this? The, what, what is going on? And so, in that regard, I, I I raise with them the people who I was talking to on a regular basis. But um, he had not reached out to me on that particular issue. Grenada's Prime Minister, the Honourable Deacon Mitchell, also appeared on the Bob Report on the occasion of his party's and government's first year in office following their June 2022 electoral victory at the polls. Our interview addressed a number of issues that defined his administration's first year in office. Yes, we did. Uh, let us talk. I, I, let, uh, we are going to regularize the workers in the service. Or, or was that uh, uh, something that you still think is possible? Well, I mean, I think we just spoke at length about the regularization framework. So yes, we did. But uh, let us I, talk. I, I let us talk, Prime Minister. Well, let us talk so, about the workers who are dismissed. No, so let's. Well, you saying workers who are dismissed, Kellon? Unless you can give me very specifics as to who you're speaking about, I'm not in a position to, to answer the question because to me, workers who are dismissed is a general proposition, right? If there are specific instances where an employee or employee's uh, employment was terminated uh, as a result of the change in, in the government. And if these employees think that the employment was not terminated fairly, the employees, whether they unionize or not, certainly have an opportunity to go through the grievance process to have that addressed. So if the Public Workers Union, for instance, can point to employees under its uh, banner who were dismissed or terminated, and if it thinks they were terminated unfairly, then the Public Workers Union and the employees have the right to go through the process, whether it's by the Labour Commissioner, uh, the Labour Minister, and ultimately an arbitration tribe, you know, to have the matter agreed or addressed. You seem to think that uh, there's an assumption in this question that every time uh, someone's employment terminates on a change in government, that it is as a result of uh, some some fault on the part of the employer. Mm -hmm. One, and I think you pointed to that, many of the jobs that were created, no, let me finish, many of the jobs that uh, are, are, were created by the former administration, in many instances, uh, were, were jobs done almost deliberately before the election, in many instances, in mass, giving people contracts that in any event were going to expire um, with fixed terms uh, to create this impression that if uh, there's a change in administration uh, and your employment subsequently comes to an end, that it is the new administration that has, that has done so. And as we are on the subject of Prime Minister Mitchell, his living in St. Lucia comments at the St. Lucia Labour Party's convention in St. Lucia drew a sharp backlash from some elements there. We invited Alan Chastenay, political leader of the United Workers' Party, to respond to Mitchell's comments. So clearly, your prime minister, and that's where the naivety um, uh, comes in, that would have arrived in St. Lucia and not taken the time to have understood both sides of the argument and to know which things not to get involved in. I've never met him. Okay, so yeah. uh, I think that there is a maturing that needs to take place in our region if this this experiment of OECS is to work. You cannot isolate and demonize leaders of the opposition. 
um, and to take advantage of you being in government to do so. Address this on the Bub report. Uh, in the New Today report, it says that uh, according to you, they're quoting you, they said that uh, you approached the bank for the loan uh, before the election and that it only materialized after the election. There are also conflicting uh, reports around the quantity of uh, monies that were received. Uh, w what is the reality here? People try to extort the truth and to make all kinds of things about it. I just stay quiet. So if you notice, I was really and truly quiet about the whole matter. So well, except, me, ex except but not, not with the New Today newspaper. The New Today newspaper reported on this. So I'm not yeah, sure you were quiet on this. Go ahead. Question. Go ahead, Honorable. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm, just, I'm just trying to answer your question, right? <laughs> no, a gentleman, the only thing that was... A gentleman once, um, he picked up the, um, the phone, and in a casual conversation, he asked me a, a question, and I answered him. And he took that, and he put it out. You know, and that's what... Mr. Worm. That was the one he... Um, who, case who where, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, ask him the question. Just, <laughs> you know, I. Right. So, and that was the one he, uh, statement that was made from my part, not giving that person the permission to send it out, but they, they went ahead and, and sent it out. In October... Grenada commemorated the 40th anniversary of the tragic and violent demise of the Grenada Revolution. This year's commemoration opened all wounds, and victims on either side of the Cold War era political divide held a reckoning on the Bub Report. The government's decision to name October 19th as National Heroes Day also polarized society on an already divisive issue. It's 40 years. If I could forgive Maurice Bishop, it took me a while and I said, you know what? If I could forgive Bernard Cord, then I could forgive Maurice too. And today, today, on this day, I no more have anything in my heart for what he did. And I could tell you and the audience listening to me that I, Dennis Charles, I am prepared now not that I would forget, because a fish rot from the head. Those things could have been stopped. He didn't, but I would forgive him. I'm a Christian. Uh, there are a lot of nuances, a lot of things that took place in that period there that, again, we cannot justify. We understand the pain and the suffering that you may have gone through, and there, there's no way to justify it. But again, remember the context in which all of this developed, where we had a group of young extremists, I, would, I would call them that, who, who were running the show behind the scenes, led by a, 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 another you know, so-called intellectual who, who they, they, they looked to as their mentor. And I guess in the, in, in the exuberance and, and enthusiasm to, to make everything go right, um, they, they made a lot of mistakes. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of people who are detained should not have been detained. And we understand that. We really understand that now in retrospect. Also, the lingering mystery of the bodies of the deceased revolutionary martyrs came under renewed scrutiny in the 40th year of the demise of the revolution. In an investigative podcast series, two years in the making, the Washington Post's Martin Powers discovered new information about the 40-year-old mystery, including the role the United States played in shaping the, late, the fate of a post revolutionary Grenada. But I also think that when it comes to the role of the U.S. in this question of the disappearance of Maurice Bishop's remains, um, you know, I don't need to tell you or really anyone, anyone else in Grenada that like this has been a theory for years and something that has um, come up again and again is, is was the U.S. somehow involved um, or what was the um, the responsibility of the government of the U.S. government in this lingering mystery. And so I think my sense has been that it has been validating for people to at least get a sense that like, yeah, that there's a reason why those questions are valid questions. Um, and while we don't have the exact answer of what happened to the bodies or um, where exactly they went, I think that the, mm -hmm. the reporting and evidence that we uncovered um, in some cases, like new things that I don't think people had ever heard before. In other cases, like going back to sources that had been you know, testified in court in 1984 or talked to students from Presentation Brothers College back in 1999 or 2000, that getting those people again and going into further detail with them, that it's all kind of created a, a stronger picture of what we do know about the events in that uh, month 
month after uh, the, the the month after October 19th and the U.S. invasion, um, and that that is helping to helping people understand a little bit more about um, what we know to have happened and the questions that are really legitimate questions going forward. On the human interest front, we sat with an Australian of Grenadian descent who went on an almost decades long quest to find her Grenadian family and Grenadian heritage, as well as to connect with her Grenadian ancestry. We traveled to Toronto, Canada to document Elizabeth Monroe's first official reunion with her paternal family after a 24 hour journey from the land down under. But before that, we covered the story of Gosnell Duncan, the Grenadian American disability advocate who is credited with the invention of the silicone dildo, which then went on to revolutionize the modern sex toy industry. These terrible materials. Gosnell's innovation was to make dildos out of medical grade silicone rubber. And that was a huge, huge change in the industry because the new materials he was using actually could be sterilized. You can sterilize them in boiling water. They could be fully cleaned. They were non-porous, non-toxic. They were actually a medical, you know, grade thing, that was a really big deal because before you have these things in novelty stores that are that are so crappy. And for him to make use these materials, to, the whole industry is all sex toys now or most sex toys are made of silicone rubber. One of my personal lifelong dreams was to visit the land of my ancestors, Africa. In the summer of 2023, I had the chance to do just that. My soul-stirring journey to Ghana accomplished what my ancestors were unable to accomplish, and that was to return to the land of their birth. I ended the tour at the haunted Elmina Castle by walking through the narrow door of no return. This was the last place many of our ancestors walked through before being herded onto European human trafficking vessels bound for lands they invaded in the so-called New World. For me, it was important to fulfill the dream of returning to the land from where my ancestors came from because enslavement prevented them from doing so. I paid homage to my ancestors by offering a libation in their honor. To you, our valued viewers and listeners, as well as our weekly guests, this program could not be possible without your support and without your participation. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say a heartfelt thank you. On behalf of our hardworking producers, I am your humble host, Dr. Kellen Bubb, wishing you a happy and prosperous 2024. Goodbye.